Hi, everybody. Welcome to another Bite Sized Educational as part of the Summer of Love. And I'm really chuffed to welcome uh, my dear friend and colleague, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Andrew. How are you doing? Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you. Now, we're going to touch on something that's really important as part of emotional well being because um and that's about physical well-being about how we feel especially pain um and just to let people know rachel will be joining us in the emotional well-being and animals group for a full facebook live chat uh, in the near future so we'll be able to unpack this a little bit more um but um yes so rachel emotional well-being and physical uh well-being they're very interconnected of course how we're feeling physically affects how we're coping emotionally of course and pain and discomfort and what to see from the animals is such a big factor, especially in behavioural presentations, whether it's a horse, a cat, a rabbit, a dog. Uh, and we need more awareness, don't we, about what that looks like and definitely what the dog is trying to communicate or the horse or the, or the cat. Um, because underlying a lot of the bigger presentations, uh, and it's not just our experience of this, there's been studies on this now we know, um, there, there's there is likely to be a pain presentation, whether that's primarily involved or secondarily. So unpack that a little bit for us. And it's such an important topic that we have this awareness that, you know, we tend to feel, oh, well, they're not limping, so they're okay pain-wise. But we know that we don't see the physical signs until there's considerable injury levels because dogs are very stoic. They hide signs of their pain. So sometimes we don't see many physical changes, but actually we may see behavioral changes instead. So this, you know, again, coming back to what you do, you know, the number of dogs that you will see that have underlying pain issues as well, that have changed the behavior, that when we improve one aspect, the other naturally improves as well. So I get clients who they'll sometimes notice that the doc stops doing something that they used to do um, or they change how they lie down or, you know, maybe they're going up the steps a little bit differently. Um, cats maybe not jumping up on kitchen surfaces the way they used to because cats love to go anywhere. And cats are actually even worse for arthritis you know, they're, they're a species that are typically out and about more. We don't necessarily see them injure themselves, and yet they are very likely to do that, climbing over fences and everything else they do. And actually, you know, behaviour is one of those areas that we may see the changes in the cat that we then need to get looked at. The other thing from the uh, Tellington Tea Touch perspective is looking at the coat changes, and if there's any you know, visible changes. The skin is the largest organ in the body. So when you consider that, the amount of changes that we can spot through changes, either in the quality of the coat or the lie of the coat, you know, it, it's absolutely fascinating. And I could talk forever on that and lots of pictures, but it's also about knowing what is your animal's normal baseline so that you know when things have changed as well. So it's often about being very aware of what they are doing, how they act normally, how they look. That actually then gives us those small indications that there may be something else going on for them. And that's really important, isn't it? Those observations and having that baseline, because even for us, you know, we can tell with our loved ones, you know, that they might seem a bit off or a bit quiet or not not wanting to go out socially or whatever all these things are signs that we can pick up from our from our human family and uh, our animals can can do the same of course and um i think this this notion about them changing their behavior and not um engaging in things that they maybe used to do is a really important one for us because it can be very easy to fall into a way of kind of prompting them to do it anyway because oh, yeah we can always do this yeah we can carry on rather than thinking maybe they can't and what else might they be trying to tell us and a lot of this will be course will be of mm. course the animal's way of looking to self protect to profession to um physically protect themselves yeah it's very much you know if we think about everything that we want for ourselves and and all our animals want is that baseline is to feel safe and that's whether that's emotionally safe physically safe mentally safe 
that baseline is the important thing that will affect everything else that we absolutely do. So it is really important to spot those little changes. Um, the other thing I, I see, it's a little bit of a, I love working with senior dogs. I love my oldies. And, you know, sometimes people say, oh, he's just getting old. And you kind of go, mm, no, there's something else going on there. You know, look at how much he's not wanting to go for walks or he's slowing down. Actually, it's not aging itself isn't a disease with age comes disease that actually we can keep them fitter for as long as we possibly can so it again is looking at those little signs and being aware of what they may be for your own dog because of course they're all individuals as well so we can talk very generally about what they're comfortable with you know um i have sight hounds that they're not the most active of breeds but even so, you know, if they don't want to go out for a walk, hmm, is it just a one off? Obviously, in this weather, they're not going out anyway. Um, but, you know, what is the change in routine that we're seeing that's different for them? You know, even if it's something like, are they drinking more? Are they drinking less? Do they not want to eat? Are they not bending down to the floor? You know, all these things will just, there, there are clues. And that's really what we've got to be sort of, detectives you know and, and work out okay well maybe i need to get this checked this is something that's new and it's different and there's something not quite right for them yeah and definitely um definitely go and speak to your vet and try and get some evidence as well i think you know taking some videos taking some photos especially if your animal struggles a little bit around with the vets um mm -hmm. you can you can at least show some things and something you said there rachel i think it's very important to, to bear in mind some of the things, some of the everyday task stuff, some of the repetitious stuff can be really becoming an aggravator for that thing. So whether it's um, uh, <clears throat> you're doing some training and the dog's pulled something, maybe their left shoulder, but then they're being expected to look, look to their left to try and get the treat, but it's a bit more challenging for them. So that means they're going to perhaps overcompensate on their right or they can change their try and shift their um, their orientation. And then if they're being forced back into that, having to put the harness on, having to get in and out the car, having to load the, into the horse box, um, uh, having to uh, reach over to get the food for the cow, all these kind of things can continue to aggravate. <clears throat> and I know myself, I get my frozen shoulder sometimes, mainly because of the size of the dogs that I tend to work with, they, they can be a bit, uh, put a bit of pressure on there. But um, I have the luxury of thinking, yeah, that's a bit ouchy. I need to rest it and I need to take some paracetamol and I need to avoid trying to use that, that arm so much. We, Our animals don't always have that luxury, do they? No. And one of our dogs, um, going back a very long time, was a lurcher puppy. And we weren't sure how he did it. He managed to get his tail under a door when he was very, very young. Um, and we were lucky it, it healed, which again, they don't always. And at the time I was doing some training with him um, and his training was great. He was a dog who enjoyed doing things with me. And we went through a phase, he would sit, he was a, a lurcher that did sit naturally. So I did put it on a cue. He went, through a phase as he grew of occasionally not sitting, not always, but occasionally. And then every now and then he'd sit, but then jump straight back up. And I kind of thought, a mm, little bit strange that. And I am going back a long time and because he was going into adolescence. I was told, oh, it's his hormones. He's trying it on, you know, make him do it. And I kind of smiled sweetly and didn't. Um, and actually took him to the vet. The vet couldn't find anything, but actually I, I found a fabulous McTimney chiropractor who I took him to, and he'd misplaced, he'd misaligned a couple of the vertebrae in his tail. We assume when he caught it under the door because he'd not done anything else with the tail. So, of course, depending on how he sat, where the tail posture was, if he sat with his tail out, it caught those vertebrae and it was uncomfortable. So he jumped back up. So then he was less willing to do it because, well, I do that. It's painful, which totally makes sense. We wouldn't do things again if it was painful. Um, so going to the McTimney chiropractor made a massive difference for him. 
But again, you know, when dogs go through life stages, we we sometimes make assumptions that, mm -hmm. oh, it's this, it's that, it's the other. It's always worth looking into that a little bit deeper because there may be something going on. And that had been probably about eight or nine months previously. So that was quite a, a long time afterwards that we saw those changes. And it does, you know, these small changes, these compensations all have knock-on effects as well. So physically, um, if we use the example that you said about the shoulder, you know, if an animal, whether it's a dog, a cat, a horse, if they've got a shoulder issue, the chances are they will offload that limb, which then puts more strain on the other limbs. And that can then be, create more problems in a another limb because of that extra weight that's on it. So then you end up with two problems instead of one, which, you know, sometimes that's when the original injury comes to light because something more obvious happens. And on that, <clears throat> on that um, presumptual thing, just to finish off, because <clears throat> flipping it around the other way, we also must make presumptions that um, just because an animal is engaging in certain activities that they've normally done, like going to agility or running around or chasing a ball, that that's an indicator that they're not in pain. Because, um, in fact, a dog that I was working with quite recently, whose gait, in my mind, wasn't right. So I, I'm trained in a quite rudimentary way, and then I can pass it on to my amazing vet physio colleague, Kate Davey, and um, and the vets, of course, and I just evidence base um, for them to make the final. Because I'm not here to diagnose my yeah. side of things. Um, uh, and uh, when the dog did have some further examination, it had a quite nasty hairline fracture, and yet the dog was still going to agility every week. And I and and the caregivers were gobsmacked by that. That the dog, but this is the role of things like cortisol and adrenaline and and the kind of joy of the moment. Uh, I think back to my late father, who was pretty bad with arthritis towards the end, but it didn't stop him gardening for four hours, much to my mother's dismay, because he'd <laughs> be there the next day. But yes, I think that's an important point to them. It is. And, and, and again, you know, you will always get extremes. You will get the dog who will stop doing things and then you will get the dogs that will carry on. But, you know, for example, if we use the example of agility, you know, if they have a slight drop in speed, you know, if their uh, runs are getting a little bit longer, or again, you mentioned earlier, and this is something I tell virtually all my clients to do, video them, you know, because you can re-watch and re-watch. You can't even, however hard we try, you can't take in the whole dog and everything you are seeing in the snapshot in a moment. But when you video it and go back to it, you've got the option of looking at everything in that moment, but repeatedly. So for being able to recognize what might be going on, so you may think, oh, he's not got as much weight on that right hind. Actually, how long is the flight phase? So how long is the limb up in the air before it makes contact to the ground? You know, it's all about piecing all the little bits together that give you that bigger picture because dogs will carry on. Like you say, the adrenaline, the cortisol, things that they've always done, they may well continue. But you may then see afterwards that they sleep for longer or they may be uh, a little less sociable with other dogs that they live with. Those little signs that are are different about them afterwards that actually then you might see it rather than in the moment brilliant well thank you rachel this has been really amazing i think the takeaways really is that um you know uh even if we're careful uh, just because the nature of what we put our animals through or what they do on a daily basis they like to have the odd pull the odd strain the odd little injury here and there like we do and yeah. and it's always worth checking in with our dogs and our horses and our cats you know we've got three dogs there they are. Uh, and, um, you know, every day we check them over just for lumps and bumps and, uh, and we just have a look at things. And when we're on the walk, I always just make a little note of, of what their game might look like and uh, do they look a bit stiff or whatever. And and these things are really important just to kind of list down and then to evidence base back to the clinical teams. I think that's what you're saying there as well and get these things checked out. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. Been amazing. Um, well Balanced Animals is your, is your company and uh, we'll make sure we share 
uh, information so people can contact you. Uh, and I know you do a lot of good uh, resources with blogs and articles and that kind of thing as well. And I really can't wait to get you into emotional well-being and animals so we can unpack this a little bit more because I'm sure there's a lot of things we can think about. Thank you so much, Rachel. And please look out for some more of these bite-sized educationals as part of this year's Summer of Love. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you.